Welcome to the SAGES resident webinar on energy-based tumor ablations. These webinars are put up by SAGES, and there have been multiple in the past, and they're geared towards a fundamental understanding of principles of surgery. Today, we're going to talk about uh, tumor ablation and ablation technologies. We have a distinguished panel of four uh, faculty, both from academic and private practice background. I will introduce each faculty member uh, before they start uh, their uh, presentation. Uh, just so you understand, on the screen you can there's a chat room. If you have any questions during the presentation or after, you can uh, put these on in writing. And when we have our panel discussion, we will try to answer as many of these questions as possible. Can I have my slides, please? So this entire series of webinars is based on the fundamental use of surgical energy program that was developed by SAGES. Um, the FUSE program really is based on the fact that a lot of surgeons don't understand electrosurgical or energy-based devices. A lot of nurses, a lot of OR teams don't understand them, and there's a lot of injuries every year in the United States and throughout the world that are very costly, and so we are part today of an effort to train young surgeons, upcoming surgeons, to understand these uh, principles. If you have uh, more interest in the FUSE program, there's an online curriculum that's very easy to get to. You just put in fundamentalsdidactics.com, as you see here on the slide, or you can just simply put FUSE program, one word, org and it will get you into the um, online curriculum. There's also a FUSE manual that can be bought um, on Amazon or any other internet place that brings the entire knowledge base together. In addition, you might consider becoming FUSE certified. There's a uh, possibility at the SAGES meeting. The upcoming meeting is in Baltimore, April 4th this year. I encourage you all to go there. During the meeting, you can um, become certified in FUSE. You can do this as well at the ACS meeting. And there are about 50 training sites throughout the country where you can become FUSE certified if you wish so. We strongly encourage you to consider that. So today, what are we talking about? And I'm just going to throw up this one slide. I'm not going to try to steal any of this thunder from um, the presenters. But essentially, we're talking about destroying a large volume of tissue. And just to illustrate the point, if you stick a monopolar pencil, i.e. a Bovi pencil, into the liver, like shown on the left here, and you heat it up to, or you set it to the highest possible energy, all you're going to get is a very small band of tissue destruction. And the reason is, you can see that around the metal tip, carbonation takes place, and carbonation acts as an insulator, and so the energy does not go very far into the tissues. And to the right, you can see a modern radio frequency ablation device that works with the same energy than the monopolar device on the left, but achieves a much larger volumetric tissue destruction. And so everything that we're going to talk about today essentially is around this phenomenon. So let me introduce our first speaker. This is Dr. James Choi. He trained under Claude Organ at UCSF East Bay, did his fellowship at USC under Dr. Selby, came back to Kaiser, and has been a very successful and uh, busy habitability surgeon at Kaiser San Jose. Dr. Choi, welcome, and please start your presentation. Thank you, Pascal, for the, for the invitation. And for those of you who are online, uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, I think this is a very uh, important topic for all surgeons to have a, a very good uh, understanding of, because as technology uh, advances, 
and technology advances exponentially these days, uh, we're going to need to use these devices more effectively and safely. And I think that a good understanding of how these uh, devices work is crucial to our successful practice. So having said that, uh, my talk is going to be on radio frequency ablation, or RFA for short. Um, the RFA basically is a treatment that uses image guidance to place a special probe directly into the tumor to destroy the target tissue. Now, the concept of RFA was uh, first described more than a thousand years ago by the Egyptians and the early Greek times. So the idea of using heat to destroy tumor is not new. In fact, uh, people at various times have explored uh, with it, and um, the concept goes way back to our times. But the, uh, the current or the modern RFA that we know of was really first described in the early 1990s. And since its early uh, modern inception, huge technical advances have been made in the field of the RFA. And because of its efficacy and relatively low rates of complications. Um, slide. Now, the RFA is based on producing a coagulative necrosis using a high-frequency alternating current that is delivered through an electrode placed in the center of the tumor. In the most common configuration um, of the clinical RFA, the monopolar RFA, the patient is actually part of a closed-loop circuit that includes an RF generator, a needle electrode, and a large dispersive electrode. And here, if I can point out, let's see. Um, here is the RF generator uh, that uh, generates, that is responsible uh, for generating the, 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 the heat and the, and the, and I'm sorry, the current, which is the power source. And here, that blue padding that you see there is the, uh, the grounding pad that usually gets placed on the patient's thigh. And here is the actual probe that is inserted into the tumor itself. So you can see that this whole system, including the patient, is a closed loop circuit, okay? So basically, this setup creates an alternating electrical field within the tissue. If I can just go back to the older slide. I'm sorry. There we go. So this whole uh, uh, setup creates an alternating electrical field within the tissue that causes agitation of the ions, OK, right here. It causes the agitation of ions present in the target tissue that surrounds the electrode, resulting in frictional heat around the electrode, okay? And the frictional heat is caused or created by the movement of ions within the tissue as they try to follow this alternating current. The discrepancy between the small area, small surface area of the needle electrode and the large area of the grounding pad causes the generated heat to be focused and concentrated around the needle electrode while the grounding pad disperses the energy over a large area to avoid skin burns. So the tissue necrosis begins as the temperature approaches 60 degrees Celsius, and that's when cellular proteins become denatured. Now, permanent tissue destruction occurs at temperatures of more than 45 degrees Celsius, and temperatures between 46 to 60 causes irreversible cellular damage after relatively longer periods of exposure. In contrast, temperatures between 60 to 100 degrees Celsius causes almost instantaneous protein coagulation with irreversible damage to mitochondria and cytosolic cell enzymes. When the temperature exceed, exceed 100 degrees Celsius, tissue fluids undergo boiling, vaporization, and ultimately carbonization. Vaporization, which occurs when tissues are heated to 
more than 100 degrees Celsius to 110 degrees Celsius produces significant gas that both serves as an insulator and retards the ability to effectively establish an RF field. Therefore, the key aim of RFA is to achieve and maintain a 50 degrees to 100 degree temperature range throughout the entire target volume. So the methods of approach, um, the percutaneous laparoscopic or open, uh, the instruments used in the clinical applications all continue to evolve as companies race to come up with better technology and sometimes with different clinical applications. An important factor that affects the success of the RFA is the ability to ablate all viable tumor tissue and an adequate tumor-free margin. So that's the key. You need to get, you need to be able to obtain a tumor-free margin. And to achieve rates of local recurrence with RFA that are comparable with those obtained by the hepatic resection, a 360-degree, one centimeter thick tumor-free margin around each tumor should be obtained, which may require multiple overlapping ablations depending on the size of the tumor. Thus, the target diameter of, of, of an ablation must be two centimeter larger than the diameter of the tumor that undergoes treatment. So for example, if you have a tumor that's say two centimeter, then you should really aim to ablate a zone of four centimeters to ensure that you get adequate margins. Now, targeting of the lesion can be performed with ultrasound, CT, or MRI, depending on the operator preference and the local availability of equipment. When we perform uh, ablations during, in an operation, we tend to use uh, ultrasound, intraoperative ultrasound, which is a very good way to localize the tumor and to ensure that we're actually hitting the tumor itself with our probe. And you can also check on the progress of the ablation as the ablation is act taking place. Um, and when percutaneous ablations are done by IR, uh, they tend to use uh, ultrasound or CT and sometimes MRI. The radiofrequency ablation is used to treat both primary and metastatic liver tumors. Um, hepatocellular carcinoma is the most common primary liver cancer and the fifth most common type of cancer in the United States. The incidence of HCC is on the rise in the U.S. and is expected to grow, continue to grow, largely as a result of increasing dissemination of hepatitis B and C viruses. The vast majority of hepatic tumors are metastatic in origin, and colorectal cancer metastases comprise the majority of such tumors. Radiofrequency ablation is an alternative therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma and liver metastases when resection cannot be performed or in cases where hepato, in, in cases hepatocellular carcinoma when transplant cannot be performed in a time, timely manner to avoid the risk of dropping off the transplant list. Um, also, uh, the indication of the RFA uh, is expanding, as I mentioned earlier, and it may be used in addition to chemotherapy or radiation therapy or as an alternative to surgery altogether. Um, these are situations when the patient is, let's say, a, not a good candidate for surgery, let's say because of bad uh, cardiopulmonary disease, uh, or due to the tumor location, or the, uh, again, patient's comorbidities, for which operation may not be possible, but in some of those cases, uh, ablation may be a valid option for those patients. Um, also, another uh, indications for RFA is when when you look at or evaluate a patient's imaging study um, and you determine that after a liver resection, um, if the patient's not going to have enough liver left for organ function, then in that situation, RFA is a good, good choice. Um, or in cases where you have tumor recurrence after resectional chemo, then RFA can also be considered as well. Uh, and then in cases where you have too many uh, tumors in, in, lobes, in both lobes of the liver where operation, there's no target tissue to remove with an operation, then, you know, in conjunction with chemotherapy, um, RFA can always be considered in those situations as well. So what determines the, the increase, the likelihood of recurrence? Um, Meta-analysis of 
95 local recurrence, I'm sorry, local recurrence is almost always a, a, the most challenging aspect of the RFA. Um, for RFA of colorectal meds, recurrence can vary between 8 to 40 percent, and overall five-year survival is reported to be between 20 to about 40 percent. For uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, um, the recurrence rate can be about 10 percent at one year and 15.4 percent at two years and about 20 percent at three years post-treatment. Now, the meta-analysis, there was a meta-analysis of 95 independent theories between 1990 and 2004, which addressed both tumor and physician-dependent factors that contribute to local recurrence. Now, as far as the tumor characteristics are concerned, uh, studies have shown that you get lower rates of recurrence uh, with a smaller size and distance or adequate distance from large blood vessels in a non-capsular location, okay? Now, there's also physician characteristics that determine the likelihood of recurrence. And the physician-dependent factors leading to better outcome or leading to better recurrence rates were a use of a surgical, either laparoscopic versus open approach, and vascular occlusion during ablation, the use of general anesthesia, and a one centimeter margin of coagulation from the periphery of the tumor, and greater physician experience. So obviously, um, that has to do with uh, having it done in a, in a center where there's high volume of uh, uh, these ablations being treated, uh, they tend to have better or lower recur recurrence rates. Um, RFA has the advantage of being a relatively low risk, minimally invasive procedure, procedure used in the treatment of uh, liver tumors. Um, overall mortality is relatively low and it's usually less than 1%. Um, however, there are complications from the RFA that we still need to be cognizant of, and uh, the, the rates for complications vary slightly uh, with the different approaches. Um, the complications overall for percutaneous, laparoscopic, and open approaches are 7.2, 9.5, and 9.9. .9. So you can see that for laparoscopic and open procedures, the overall complication rates tend to be a little higher, perhaps because, you know, they were in operation, uh, but the rates tend to be lower for percutaneous procedures. Uh, but the mortality, however, is very low across the board. Uh, for percutaneous, it's only 0.5 percent, and most theories record no mortality for laparoscopic and open approaches. Um, the different complications that can happen with an RFA Overall, you can expect to have about almost 9% uh, complication rates, and they include bleeding, infection, uh, biliary damage leading to biloma, uh, liver failure, pulmonary complications, skin ground, grounding pad burn, um, vascular injury, visceral injury, cardiac complications, renal failure, and tumor seeding. But you can see that even though the overall complication rates may be 9%, the individual complication rates are actually very low. Uh, if you look at the list, they're mostly about 1% or lower. So that's one of the reasons why RFA is a very popular choice for treatment for those patients who are otherwise not candidates for an operation. So I would like to uh, show you an example here. Uh, this first example is of a, is of a um, 65-year-old male with a metastatic colorectal cancer to the liver. He initially had a sigmoid colectomy, and within 12 months, he formed uh, liver lesions in the segment, uh, I believe it was two, and then he subsequently had an operation to remove that tumor in segment two. Uh, but we, unfortunately, in about eight months later, uh, he was found to have another lesion uh, that you can see here on the CT. Uh, Reoperation was considered, however, the patient, uh, having, having finished uh, two operations uh, within about two to three-year period, uh, was rather fatigued from operations and opted for uh, ablation instead. So he was referred, he was consulted by IR, and interventional radiologist did agree to take the case on, and they uh, went ahead and performed um, in a, a percutaneous ablation, and this is what you see here. So. This particular radiologist used an ultrasound guidance, 
and you can see, if I can use that arrow again, you can see this uh, track, okay, this white line here, that represents the probe that's going into the liver parenchyma, and then here it, you can see it clearly en entering the tumor itself, okay? So once again, here's the probe going in, and here's the, the, the liver lesion that the probe is penetrating. So ultrasound, um, it, it's very important to use image guidance to ensure that you're hitting the right target, okay? And so the patient underwent successful percutaneous ablation, and this is six months after ablation. You can see that uh, you can see a nice clear ablation zone without evidence, without an obvious evidence of a recurrence. And this is one year after ablation, and you can see that, um, if I can use that arrow again, you can see that the, the ablation zone is actually a little bit smaller now, and it's beginning to scar, okay, and without evidence of uh, tumor recurrence, okay. Next slide. So this is another example. Uh, this example is of a 20, I mean, I'm sorry, 79-year-old male with a history of chronic hepatitis C with otherwise a good liver function, was found to have a hepatoma, and it was read as LIRAT5, okay? So he was initially referred for possible transplant and uh, was considered by the transplant team. However, due to his uh, social issues and the fact that he's got the liver function, his score was obviously not high enough to qualify for a new liver, and uh, he was then referred to us for management of this liver uh, lesion or hepatoma. And uh, operative resection versus percutaneous ablation was considered, but due to his comorbidities, and I believe he had an ejection fraction of about uh, 25 to 35 percent, um, he did not want to go through an operation, and he also opted to have an ablation, a percutaneous ablation. So he had uh, percutaneous ablation of this liver lesion, which I'll point out with the arrow again here. Let's see. Okay. Right. Okay, here we go. Let me point out the lesion right here. I hope everybody can see that. Okay. So that was subjected to percutaneous ablation, and this is six months post-ablation of that um, hepatoma, and you can see the ablation zone here and uh, obviously there's no evidence of recurrence. And he's about two years out now from the ablation, and he still has no evidence of recurrence. Um, and um, and uh, that's actually a testament to the, um, the, the low mortality, I mean, the low complications with uh, highly effective uh, treatment that RFA can provide for the right patients. Um, so that's about all I have to present. I'll turn it over to Pascal. Um, James, this Hello? thank you very much, James. This was a, a yeah. fantastic uh, nutshell presentation of what RFA is, what it can do, and how it can be used. Um, I don't think that there is a liver surgeon today that does not has that technology in his armamentarium. And as you pointed out, uh, from the very beginnings where we had 50-watt ablation systems, which were very weak, we now can ablate with over 200 watts. That's enough to light two 100 watt uh, light bulbs in, in the abdomen. And indeed, when you ablate for a long time or many lesions, the anesthesiologist will tell you that the body temperature rises. That's how much energy gets deposited in these tissues. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go and introduce Dr. Professor David Ioannidi. He will talk about um, a different technology that has come up and is essentially equal to the radiofrequency ablation method. Dr. Ioannidi is uh, the chief of uh, HBB surgery at the Carolinas Medical Center. He also is the director of HBB fellowship. If anybody in the audience has interest, um, use this as a um, networking introduction in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, Dr. Ioannidi has worked in the lab for many, many years to improve and develop a microwave technology, and he's going to talk to us today about how microwave works. David, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. 
uh, Fix You Burn. I was asked to uh, talk about how does microwave ablation work. And so, again, I'm a physics uh, geek, and I really enjoy physics. But I will agree with the, you know, the mission of Fuse. You know, we use very powerful devices in the operating room. And I think it's really important for us to truly understand how they work so we can use them in a safe and efficacious way. So my talk today is how does microwave work? And again, I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's obviously many different ways to destroy tumors, as you can see here, most commonly microwave, radiofrequency, cryo, and IRE. And as Dr. Choi mentioned, there are monopolar radiofrequency ablation systems that have been commercially available since 1997. And there are different types of systems. You have those with deployable arrays and those with straight needles uh, usually cooling the, the tip. And then there's also bipolar radiofrequency ablation where the current is only limited between the two electrodes. And that really never took off anywhere in the world. So we've done a lot of work uh, in our lab uh, understanding radiofrequency and microwave. And one of the misconceptions I think that happens is that if you have a deployable array, as you can see, this is just an auger uh, with a generator. Uh, we hot-wired it a little bit. Um, one would think that the energy distribution across that uh, array is even. But that's actually not true, because electricity does two things. It always seeks ground, and it always, ta always takes the path of least resistance. So it doesn't make sense from a physics point of view that the current would be evenly distributed. What actually happens is that when you start applying current, and say this green bar is where the ground is in the beaker, so you actually focus the current along one of the tines with the least amount of resistance or impedance, which would in this case would be next to the ground, and you start getting thermal coagulation around those tines. And as the impedance of those tines increases, then the current will jump, and then it will jump and jump. And so you can clearly see that this would be an opportunity for incomplete ablation, particularly if a time went into a low resistance structure, like a bile duct or a blood vessel, which you may not see. We've done a lot of work trying to make RF better with multi-probe ablation for deployable arrays, with cool tips, with the controllers, using uh, hypertonic saline and alginate gels. And basically, our conclusion with monopolar rate of frequency is that we've sort of moved down them. So clinically, I've been doing microwave ablation since 2003, and it's been commercially available since 2008. So let's take a step back and look at the energies that we're talking about. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and on the left side is radio frequency, so AM radio, which is about 460 to 480 kilohertz. So when you think about that frequency and you think about the wavelengths, those wavelengths are massive wavelengths. And so these are a couple of AM antenna. And so those wavelengths are hundreds of meters long. So when you, the tissue, the tumor, interact with something of a wavelength that long, how does your body see it? Well, you see that in the form of particles. And so you see it in the form of electric current. Well, what about? If we then said, well, we don't want to see electric current, why don't we match the wavelength to the size of the ablation that we want? So if you think about that, and you say, all right, I want a wavelength around 3, 4, 5 centimeters, because that has clinical relevance in the liver world, what does that do? Well, if you calculate the, the, wave, the frequency, that puts you in microwave frequency. And so if you look at the higher end of the electromagnetic spectrum, anywhere from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz, that is the microwave frequency. And so 915 and 245 are the common ones. 915 is your cell phone. 245 is the microwave oven you have in your kitchen. There's some 915 ones, but that's OK. And a few other frequencies that are out there. So that frequency is matched to tissue size, OK? And so when you look at antenna tuning, we can't use any frequency that we want. A lot of those frequencies are controlled by the FCC. But there are some frequencies that are available for public use, 915 megahertz, 245 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, 9.2 gigahertz. And the first microwave systems available in the United States were 915 megahertz. The first one in Japan was 245. So if you look at the bottom here, if you look at a half a wavelength uh, in liver tissue, uh, of those different frequencies, you can see that for 915, it's about 3.5 centimeters. And for 245, a half a wavelength, 
is 1.4 centimeters or 3 centimeters. Exactly what we want. Because when we match the wavelength to the tissue, we're not seeing that energy as particles or electric current where the tissue is interacting with that frequency as waves. And so that is profoundly different. And just to close out the circle, this is what I do, by the way, when I drive around. I look at all the antennas and the high tension cables. And uh, so right here are uh, cell phone towers. Those are 915 towers. Those are 245 and 5.8 gigahertz uh, 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 towers there. So what's microwave? This is, I think, probably the most beautiful picture ever taken, ever. This is the background radiation noise of the uh, microwave radiation of the universe. Anyway, the, um, when we talk about microwave, we're talking about frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum below optical, for sure, you know, at 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. Now, the wavelength at those frequencies is going to be directly proportional to the permittivity. So think of permittivity as the same thing as electrical resistance or electrical impedance if you're in alternating current. And so different permittivities will give you different wavelengths based on a specific frequency. All these other things here are, uh, um, I'll walk through, are the technical aspects of a microwave system. So wavelength, as I mentioned here, is directly proportional to the frequency and to the impedance, or the permittivity, which is the same thing as electrical resistance in a uh, direct current. Um, the frequency of microwave is 300 uh, megahertz to 300 gigahertz. And then the permittivity, otherwise known as the dielectric current uh, constant, varies from tissue to tissue, primarily based on its water content. So if you look at tissues, you can see the permittivity here. You can see air is terrible, right? Microwave doesn't like to go through air. It's, uh, you really have to push a lot of power behind it. But as you get human tissues, you see the permittivity varies a little bit. Um, and you can see the wavelength uh, within these tissues. Uh, for 915 is about 4 change, and for 245 is about 2 centimeters. So as Dr. Choi was saying, how, tissue, how energy is deposited is very different, completely different between RF and microwave. With radio frequencies, as you mentioned, you have a radio frequency generator, and basically you're passing electric current through the patient to the grounding pad and back. And so you have high current concentration at the needle point, and you diffuse that um, uh, energy concentration with uh, multiple uh, grounding pads. With microwave ablation, there is no electric current being passed through the patient. You're placing an antenna into tissue, and then you're applying energy, and that energy is deposited into the tissue not with electric current, but with waves. And so, as Dr. Cho is mentioning, the mechanism of tissue heating um, for radiofrequency ablation with a high energy concentration around the active, well, they're both active electrodes, but we tend to call it the active electrode or the radiator tip. Um, it uh, agitates the local ions, and through conduction, it heats up the local tissue, okay? With microwave, as you're passing waves through the tissue, the waves are oscillating back and forth, the, electric, the magnetic um, uh, properties of the wave will then affect the dipole molecule. So as I mentioned, if you have high water content tissue, then the water molecules are actually going to flip back and forth, so at two and a half billion times a second, along with those waves. And it's that um, heating that gives you tissue temperatures of 100 to 150 degrees Celsius. So let's look at the components of a microwave system. You need a generator, you need a transmission line, an antenna, which we, we mis-term this, and the tissue itself. And actually, with all of these four components, then you have a complete microwave system. You don't have a complete microwave system without actually the tissue. So here's your generator. You have connectors with a cable, another connector. Now, we call this generally this whole thing an antenna, but it's not. This is actually a transmission line. And the antenna is actually just a radiating tip, technically. So how do you make microwaves? Well, there's three different ways to make microwaves. One is traveling wave tube, which aren't used in any commercial microwave system. The earliest uh, systems uh, were using magnetrons, which you have a motor, and you're spinning a brush within um, a metal uh, casing that has side slots, and you get uh, electrons building up in these slots, and those go shooting down a conductor. 
Now all the microwaves, the modern microwave systems used in the United States, all generate microwaves with solid state technology, beautiful circuit boards, and then you just amplify that technology to whatever wattage you're trying to push based on your uh, cable impedance and how much power you want at the tip. So once you generate the microwave energy, then you've got to get it from point A to point B, and we use that transmission line. And we use coax cable. I'm sure everybody who's wired up their TV knows what coax is. And so basically coax is an inner conductor, right, the inner copper right there. That's your inner conductor. Then you have Teflon around the inner conductor, and that is invisible to microwaves. Then you have an outer conductor and then an insulator on the outside. So here's the outer conductor here. And how coax works um, is that it spirals the waves within the outer conductor down the length of that coax cable guided by the inner conductor. So the outer conductor traps the waves inside. And that's why you want good insulated monster cables. This is not an advertisement for monster because you have heavy insulation, so you don't have external waves interfering with your, um, your programming um, uh, when you watch the TV. Now, we, dissect, we take apart a lot of these antennas, and you can see the conductors there. So now you've got the wave going down a transmission line, and now you want to put it into tissue. And so there are different antenna designs. And so very quickly, the most simple is a monopole. So when you're going to splice your coax to your TV, you cut off the outer conductor and the, um, the PCFE, and you leave an exposed inner conductor. And then you have a connector here and here. Well, to efficiently transmit microwaves or radio frequency energy, you, that length of exposed inner conductor needs to be at least half the wavelength. So shorter than that, you need to push more power, but you need half a wavelength there. Now, the earliest Japanese antennas were basically this. It was just, un just unprotected, exposed inner conductor set at half a wavelength, about a centimeter and a half, a 245, um, and it's a very inefficient system. So we've improved over the time, and so the next generation of monopole antennas Basically, we put a reflector on the end to try to keep the microwaves back. So we're trying to reflect the wave backwards. Then we can coat that with ceramic, and ceramic is completely invisible to microwaves. And then you can surround that whole contraption with a PMA type of plastic, which is also um, um, invisible to microwaves. So this gives you your rigidity and a nice point, and you can stick that into tissue. And that's what a commercial product looks like. And we help build these things. So that's a monopole antenna, then you have a dipole antenna. A little bit more complicated, but not really. So basically what you do is you strip off, rather than a half a wavelength, a quarter of a wavelength of the inner conductor, as well as extend the outer conductor another quarter of a wavelength. And if you line these up perpendicular to the cable, then you're at half a wavelength. Now this would be an end fire, which we don't use. So you can just rotate these back, and now you have half a, a quarter of a wavelength of the outer conductor, a quarter of a wavelength of the inner conductor, and this gives you a half a wavelength. And that's what a dipole antenna looks like. And so in the middle of the dipole, you have this. So this is where the conductor rolls back. And so that is the source, and this is the antennas all taken apart, this is what we do, um, is that the feed point of the um, microwave itself, you can see there's a half a wavelength right here, the feed point is where the inner and the outer conductor are folded back and perpendicular to each other. Now, what interesting thing happens is as you send a wave down a cable and say this is where the antenna passes into the tissue, there's going to be a permittivity change from the cable to the tissue. And so as the wave hits the different permittivity, you can see that the amplitude and the wavelength may change a little bit because of the change in permittivity, but also you get a reflected wave back. And so the generally good machine should be able to pick up the amount of reflected energy so if there's too much reflected energy for whatever reason, the machine will kick off. The other downside of uncontrolled reflected energy clinically is that you can have waves traveling up or even between multiprobe uh, microwave antenna, and you can conduct waves up more proximally, and that can result in burning of tissue, like this is a skin burn that I created uh, because my antennas are too close together, and that's sort of an unwanted um, outcome. So you have to understand all these things. So to 
try to control that energy and try to decrease reflected energy coming back up, you can't control the permittivity, obviously, then you can choke your antennas. And by choking antennas, you give more outer conductor exposed back up on the cable to try to keep that wave concentrated at the radiating tip so you don't have waves carrying back up the cable itself, causing damage that you might not want. There's all different types of chokes and reflectors that you can use to try to control that energy. And again, this is just some of our design stuff that we do. Uh, and you can see here's how the wave comes off an antenna. Remember, the only the tip is really the antenna. So now you're saying to yourself, OK, Dave, well, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. We're passing waves, electromagnetic waves, through tissue. I remember from physics in high school that the energy of a wave falls off at 1 over distance squared, right? Anyone remember that? So that means that the further you get away from the uh, radiating tip, then the energy is going to fall off really dramatically, theoretically. But what we notice clinically in microwaves is that you actually have a microwave near field where the energy density through that near field is actually consistent, and then at a certain point it falls off. Well, why is that? So again, this is just different um, uh, frequencies, and you can see the energy density is fairly consistent for a certain distance, and then it falls off. It falls off sharper with a higher frequency. Well, this is where fun with physics comes in. So it depends on how that wave is created. So these are the different parts of a microwave as it gets emitted through tissue. And this is your antenna here, and the immediate area near the antenna, there's crazy physics going on there. You have really high energy currents, and you have really high magnetic fields there. And so this is called a quasi-static zone. And you have this really intense energy and magnetic field. And what that does, and you can see that the, um, the energy is going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, right, of course, is that induces a wave. Okay, so it's that high energy, high magnetic field that's coming. Remember, you're sending waves down, right, positive, negative, positive, negative. And that really um, intense field is going to create a wave. But the wave is not going to be a planar wave adjacent to the antenna. You're actually creating spherical waves off the antenna. And as these spherical waves travel out, they don't lose energy. They don't lose their energy until they convert over to planar waves. So really, at, depending on the frequency, but clinically for the frequencies that we use, about two centimeters off of that radiating tip is where you go from a transition of a, a spherical wave to a planar wave. And then when you get to a planar wave, the energy, then the energy falls off at 1 over d squared. And that's why you have a tight microwave field. And this is a planar wave here. You have an electrical uh, field and a magnetic field that are perpendicular to each other. And again, that energy falls off fast. And that's why for these frequencies, this is 2, 4, 5, you see even energy distribution for a certain period, about 2 centimeters, and then that energy falls off because this is the transition point where you transfer from spherical waves to planar waves. So that makes all the sense in the world. And so um, this is called the microwave near field, and this is called the microwave far field. And this is also clinically important to notice. And again, this is all the stuff we do in our lab. Uh, we develop and test all of these uh, things. And this is just um, um, uh, heat sensitive paper, so you can see an even energy distribution, and then the energy falls off. And the cool thing is that for that microwave near field, we figured out that you can actually visualize it in real time with power Doppler on your ultrasound settings. And usually the scale, this is four because this is ex vivo, but your scale of your uh, power Doppler is usually eight centimeters per second. That's what we usually set it at. So you can actually visualize in real time the near field effects of the microwave field, which is really cool. So if you really want to know if you're ablating something, you look at this. And we've, of course, correlated this in uh, respected specimens and in all that. Correl we've presented all of that. So now, this is how you create, this is how you put energy into the tissue. So how do you heat up tissue? Well, there's three ways that you heat up tissue. The radiation, conduction and convection. And this is also clinically significant. So what are all these things? There's radiation. I'm not talking about ionizing. We're talking about non-ionizing non radiation. So the microwave near field, the spherical wave zone, is heated up through radiation. 
Think of radiation as you're facing the sun outside and your face warms up. That's radiation, okay? Conduction means that if you have a temperature difference between one thing and another, I'm putting my hand on my counter right now. My hand is warm, my counter is cold, and through conduction, I'm going to put my heat into this counter. And then you have convection, which is you need a current, not electrical current, you need air current or water current, and that is used to either transmit, to give, or take heat away. So if you do like sous vide cooking like I do, that's a convection current. Or if you jump in the ocean, you fall you know, in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, you don't want to flail around. You want to stay bundled up because that, when you're flailing your arms, you're creating currents and your heat is dissipating away from you faster. So bundle up like a ball. So when you put a microwave antenna into tissue, okay, the size and the shape of the microwave near field is going to be completely dependent on the frequency, the permittivity of the tissue, and the antenna design. And regardless of the energy, this microwave near field, once you put that antenna in, is set. Okay, there's no changing that. Okay? And then what you can control is two variables, power and time. So as you start putting power into this microwave near field, you start creating this thermal mass, this thermal sphere that's evenly heated up, regardless of what's in there. If your hand is in there with a glove on, you're going to heat up your hand. And so that microwave near field is heated up through radiation. Nothing affects that, nothing. And then as you create this thermal mass, then that thermal mass outside of the microwave near field is going to heat up the tissue around it, just like radiofrequency ablation, um, and that's going to give you the outer zone or the conductive zone, um, which can be susceptible to thermal effects. So now the term heat sink gets thrown around a lot, and there's lots of misunderstanding, so I'm going to explain that really quick. So there are actually, there isn't something he said. It's either an electrical sink or a thermal sink or both. Well, what's an electrical sink? As I mentioned, if you understand electricity, electricity is very simple. Electric current is very simple. It always does two things. Always seeks ground, always takes the path of least resistance. Super easy, easy physics. So now, say for instance, you put a RF antenna or, excuse me, my RF electrode into tissue, you're going to heat up that tissue through conduction. You're passing electricity through that tissue back to the um, return electrode. But if you have in that um, high energy density zone, if you have a low impedance structure, like a bile duct or a blood vessel, or in the lab we'll do it, we'll just stick a copper cable in there, then what's going to happen is since that is a lower resistance or impedance, then that current is selectively going to shoot down that structure. So beyond, behind that, you won't get heating because that energy was taken away. With microwaves, you put a microwave antenna in and the same blood vessels there, here's the microwave near field. It doesn't matter because you have spherical waves coming out. It doesn't matter what's right here. This heat, even behind this blood vessel, bile duct, this tissue is still going to get heated just like this tissue. That's an electrical thing. Now, as I mentioned with microwaves, the inner zone of the microwave near field is heated up through radiation. Nothing affects that. And then you have a thermal mass, which is going to conduct heat out. And that con heat conduction is obviously going to be um, uh, affected by the overall size. And then convection, because you have your liver is like a big radiator. It's going to pull heat away like a radiator. So that zone, the ground zone, is potentially susceptible to a thermal sink where that heat can be taken away with flow. So when you look at the different frequencies, the first frequencies that we used in the U.S. were 915 megahertz. So when you look at different frequencies based on normalization of energy, excuse me, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy density, however, the lower the depth of penetration. So 9.2 gigahertz, which I have it generated myself, um, very high energy, but only penetrates a few millimeters. Uh, 915, which is our first in the U.S., which we don't make anymore, um, not as much energy, more than RF, um, and you can see that it penetrates a little bit deeper. This is the ablation zone here above the dotted line. And then 245, a little bit of higher energy, and it falls off fairly quickly. Well, we compared clinically our outcomes for 915 and 245, and then we normalized, because you're comparing apples and oranges, when you normalize that, and you look at the amount of power that we put in, you can ablate the same amount of tumor in about half the time 
with 245 than you can with 915 because it's twice the energy because it's twice the frequency for the same amount of power. So again, 915 has sort of gone away. And currently, the three main systems in the US are all 2.45 gigahertz system. And we're on our third or fourth generation of microwaves right now. They're all slightly different, but they're all solid state technology. They have little differences between them, but these are the commercially available systems today. Now, the nice thing about microwave is that we can do a lot more with microwave than we ever did with RF. We can do multiple ablations. I've ablated 50 lesions at once. And then some of the limitations, because you use conductive heating with RF, you know, you always hear that you can't ablate anything greater than three centimeters. That's completely untrue with microwave. With microwave, we can do large volume ablations. We can wipe out the whole liver if we want to. That's usually counterproductive, so we try not to. Usually we've got to knock out more than a third at a time if we have to. But all those limitations that we had because of the physics of monopolar RF, we've overcome with microwave. And certainly we've published on this. I think Dr. Berber is going to talk about the clinical uh, use of these technologies, but this is one of our bigger papers in the annals of surgery, again, showing the effectiveness of uh, microwave clinically. So in conclusion, microwave is definitely a safe and effective technology with lots of power. Clearly from a physics point of view, and certainly we've seen from a clinical point of view, it has advantages over monopolar ready frequency ablation. Um, each frequency has its advantages and limitations. The current frequency in the US is 245 gigahertz, which I think is a good all around ablation tool. But I think for you guys, the audience, really the understanding of the physics of microwave and even the other technologies, monopolar RF, um, harmonic, uh, bipolar vessel sealing devices is really essential, not useful, but essential so that we can use these technologies most effectively and certainly safely for the benefit of our patients. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Yaniti. That was very, very good and uh, really kind of opens up our mind to how complex the physics of the things are that we do to patients in the operating room, and we better get on to understand them. So thank you again for the pitch for FUSE. This is really the first um, program, learning program in the world to teach um, the uh, function, safety, and principles of energy devices. And what better than the microwave talk from Dr. Ignati to bring this point home? Uh, again, Dr. Yanidi is uh, the director of the HPB Fellowship, and I'm sure uh, that some in, in the audience might consider doing a fellowship, and um, there's nobody uh, better than Dr. Yanidi to teach you those kinds of um, technologies uh, for liver ablation. Our next speaker is Professor Ur, uh, Berber, Urban Berber. He comes from the Center for Endocrine Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, originally um, from San Francisco, um, and he has a huge clinical experience with ablation not only of liver uh, tumors but of all sorts of tumors, and he will talk to us today about the clinical indications for uh, liver ablation. Uh, Dr. Berber, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Berber is um, a part of the FUSE committee at SAGES, is very active in uh, our endeavor to understand uh, these energy devices. Thank you for coming, and please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Pascal. So it's really great introduction into ablation by the previous speakers, and I will try to explain how we use this in our clinical practice. Uh, so um, let me, OK. So. Uh, as, as a disclosure, I'm a consultant for Medtronic, uh, and I will try to present an evidence-based uh, uh, presentation. Uh, when we look at uh, the clinical use of ablation, we have to acknowledge uh, the problem. Uh, for instance, in the United States, colorectal cancer is the most uh, common tumor type. And if you look at about 160,000 patients presenting with uh, colorectal cancer in the U.S. every year, one-fourth of them will develop a liver metastasis. This is a huge number. And, this, and then the resection always is the gold standard, but unfortunately most patients are not candidates uh, for resection either because of too much liver disease 
some extra hepatic disease or accompanying medical comorbidities. And despite the advances, uh, uh, chemotherapy is not definitive uh, for these patients. And we also acknowledge that uh, uh, although resection is the gold standard, uh, um, you know, when we are doing an open resection, there's significant uh, comorbidity as well. And there are some examples of patients who are not candidates uh, for resection, especially with uh, the advent of chemotherapy. We're seeing these patients more and more often. Uh, you will see that uh, with chemotherapy, the patients uh, will have some regression of their uh, liver metastasis, but you're left with uh, these multiple uh, lesions in the liver, so what to do about them. Or some patients might have uh, extrahepatic disease. Uh, this is more of an issue, I think, uh, for colorectal cancer, uh, because you can still debate whether you should do any curative treatments or not. Uh, well, whereas it would be less important for patients with neuroendocrine metastasis. And as I mentioned, uh, despite the resection being the gold standard, if, even in the top center, there's one to two percent mortality and, mor and morbidity goes up to 40 percent. But we still have to acknowledge that uh, resection is uh, <clears throat> the modality that gives the patient the best chance of cure at this time. I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail, but just maybe historically I mentioned that our clinical experience uh, has really blossomed with radiofrequency ablation, but uh, the issue with radiofrequency ablation is that um, there's a high local recurrence rate, which uh, uh, has a wide range in uh, different series, but uh, goes up to 35 to 40 percent in some of the series, and unfortunately it's worse for colorectal cancer which is the tumor type that we're dealing with most in the United States. I was a very busy RSA user, and then this paper that appeared in British Journal of Surgery in 2015 by the Sloan Kettering team changed my perspective uh, because uh, with microwave, uh, uh, about 8% local recurrence rate was uh, reported, and this has been explained, but just uh, from a clinician, so what does this mean for the clinician? <clears throat> Basically, the uh, microwave uses a uh, different type of uh, uh, physical properties, and uh, the end result is you get the temperature rise uh, faster and more homogeneous. And uh, theoretically, this could be uh, what contributes to lower um, recurrence rate. <clears throat> One of the issues with the microwave technology uh, is that in contrast to radiofrequency ablation, uh, because of the physical constraints, uh, you are not able to achieve spherical ablation zones. The not being able to achieve spherical ablation zones is pretty disturbing for a surgical oncologist because we, we see ablation as uh, similar to resection, and we got to get the radial margin, and you got to get at least a centimeter of margin if possible. And so uh, treating the liver tumors with the old-fashioned microwave technology uh, was not so attractive. But uh, over the last year, the technology has advanced. Uh, some tricks have been used. And actually, you're able to achieve spherical ablation zone with the microwave ablation uh, technologies as well. Uh, in the operating room, we like to do this laparoscopically if possible. Um, there are significant clinical benefits, including obviously uh, minimal invasiveness, fast recovery, being able to stage the whole abdomen, being able to treat multiple tumors in all segments, and um, being able to move some critical structures away from the ablation zone, such as the diaphragm or the colon or the stomach. Uh, whereas, because you're not giving the patient a big incision, uh, the recovery is uh, still similar to the percutaneous ablation. Therefore, uh, as surgery, we're a little bit biased towards doing laparoscopic ablations. Uh, obviously, I think, in my opinion, the exception would be the patients uh, with maybe small uh, solitary lesions and not really good candidates for general anesthesia. I think those patients are better served with uh, uh, by percutaneous ablation. But this is how the operating room looks like. Uh, we have uh, two 12 millimeter uh, trocars, one for the laparoscope and one for the 
laparoscopic ultrasound transducer, and the microarray ablation needle is inserted uh, uh, through a separate puncture. If when we're doing our phase as well, uh, the same uh, trocar placement is used. Uh, the only difference is that the RFA needles are stainless steel and they're more durable compared to microwave needles, and so you don't necessarily need to have a separate uh, trocar for the ablation uh, needle. And this slide summarizes uh, the uh, benefits that we have uh, seen using the uh, laparoscopic approach, and I'm going to extend uh, the uh, advantages in also into identification of unsuspected lesions. Uh, we, as well as others, have shown that laparoscopic ultrasound uh, uh, outperforms uh, um, the preoperative uh, imaging studies, including MRI. We recently have data showing that even compared to MRI, laparoscopic ultrasound identifies additional lesions about 10% of the patients. And the other uh, benefit that I'm going to include here is that laparoscopically being able to monitor the ablation with uh, real-time ultrasound is a big plus because, uh, uh, you know, we didn't really spent too much time in the previous talks, I think, but there are some algorithms that are recommended to use with uh, each technology. But with surgeons, we look at uh, ablation as the tool in our hands and we do all our own algorithms. And if uh, on the laparoscopic ultrasound, I'm not happy about uh, how the ablation is uh, evolving around the existing tumors, I'm going to do another overlap. So you cannot do this with the percutaneous ablation, but I think being able to monitor uh, the ablation aggressively with laparoscopic ultrasound is a big plus to consider laparoscopic resections. So over time, based on experience and looking at the outcomes of the patient, we've developed some uh, algorithms. Again, these are not the result of uh, randomized studies, but mostly uh, reasonable clinical experience. For colorectal liver metastasis, uh, in our experience, we saw some benefit of not treating more than eight lesions, and the total volume included uh, by this tumor should be less than 20%. Otherwise, you can give the patients uh, some liver failure. It will be too much ablation time, and you run into other some complications, uh, including some renal complications if you uh, ablate uh, too much tissue and you're in the operating for too long. In the whole experience, uh, we have, especially in the early days, we've treated lesions up to eight centimeters, but currently I believe that uh, probably four centimeters should be the largest diameter unless there are some clinical indications because uh, most of the ablation technology is enabled to you to pre, uh, create about five centimeter ablation zones with a single stick. And for that reason, I believe that up to four centimeter lesions for colorectal could be attempted with ablation, but anything larger, uh, you're not going to have adequate margin and you will have to do overlaps and then, then that decreases your um, efficacy. Very important that uh, the, the patient should not have biliary dilatation uh, because although the blood vessels uh, are pretty resilient, the bile ducts are not, and you can create uh, biliary complications. And I have to emphasize the patient should unre have unresectable disease, or if you're treating resectable disease, there should be a really good communication with the patient about why uh, this is done. And we're going to talk about some other clinical scenarios. And obviously, uh, no extrahepatic disease or minimum extrahepatic disease that's treatable, also desirable. And if you look at uh, the distribution in our center, probably similar to other uh, cancer centers in the country, about half of the patients are colorectal, and the rest are divided between primary neuroendocrine and other tumor types. And looking at the results, uh, obviously, there's really no randomized study look, comparing the outcome of uh, ablation patient with resection patients. But uh, in our retrospective analysis, uh, when we looked at the patient with small solitary colorectal metastasis, less than three centimeters, 
even with RFA, local tumor control rate was uh, pretty high. It was about 82 percent. And in these patients, when we compared their outcomes with the reduction patients undergoing reduction for, uh, against solitary small colorectal metastasis, we did not really see a difference in their overall or uh, disease-free survival. Again, these uh, results are not a result of uh, randomized studies, but I guess it makes sense if you have a small tumor, you know, you're going to take that under control with ablation, it recurs, you can follow the patient closely and resect or ablate for salvage therapy, then the outcome should not be much different, uh, you know, unless the biology is different. This is probably one of the most important uh, pieces of data uh, related to uh, the benefits of ablation. It's a clock trial, multi-center study from Europe uh, that uh, randomized uh, uh, patients uh, uh, into systemic therapy versus systemic therapy plus ablation. And less than 10 lesions, pretty much similar to the patient population we were treated, and the patients end up having about four lesions uh, in the uh, combined treatment uh, uh, arm and five in the systemic uh, treatment arm. And although in the early uh, results, uh, other than uh, some differences in progression-free survival, uh, the results were not impressive, their delayed results, uh, long-term uh, results, uh, I think it's important to look at these uh, survival curves, uh, both the uh, overall and disease-free survival were significantly improved in the patients who had uh, combined treatment. So these data, I think, speaks for the rationale to introduce ablation into uh, the treatment algorithm of those patients with uh, uh, by low bar multiple uh, colorectal uh, metastasis and not just really rely on chemotherapy in these, uh, in these patients. For neuroendocrine tumors, uh, the algorithm is a little bit different. Uh, first of all, neuroendocrine tumors respond much better to ablation than colorectal metastasis. The local treatment failure rate is about 5% per lesion for neuroendocrine tumors compared to about 30% for colorectal. So there's a huge difference, which means that you can uh, treat uh, more lesions. And uh, we also know that the studies have shown that the bulking really uh, helps in the overall uh, oncological uh, outcome of these patients. And recent studies show that you can, even if you do 70% debulking, uh, there is a survival benefit. So the algorithm is more uh, flexible for neuroendocrine liver metastasis. Uh, and generally go up to 12 lesions on preoperative imaging, but still, you have to make sure that uh, you, you're treating less than 200 percent of liver volume. If you have more, you will have to stage, and it would be too much uh, uh, ablation to do in one day. Again, the same uh, concerns about uh, the bile ducts uh, are applying here as well. So we don't treat any lesions about the main or the right left hepatic duct. As I mentioned, because of symptom palliation as well, uh, ablation uh, becomes really important in these patients. And when we look at the experience at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, it turned out that patients with isolated, discrete, large lesions were being rejected. Those patients with extensive disease were being embolized, and then those patients in between were uh, being ablated. And then when these uh, selection criteria were followed, each group of patients uh, had really favorable outcomes. I don't want to go into too much uh, details about uh, this slide, but uh, this is, I think, a reasonable algorithm to employ in a given institution. For HCC, uh, we would like to mention that uh, for patients with resectable disease, uh, uh, no ho poor hypertension, plate count greater than 100,000, uh, again, we still uh, consider uh, resection, but those with unresectable disease, uh, poor hypertension, play count less than 100,000, uh, probably less than three tumors, and dominant tumor size less than four, ablation uh, could be considered. 
Uh, regarding the selection of percutaneous with laparoscopic ablation, uh, based on the literature for small hepatocellular cell cancer, percutaneous ablation is recommended, and for small and larger abla uh, lesions, laparoscopic ablation seems to be better. Uh, a lot of uh, studies have been done uh, in the Far East regarding uh, the outcome of ablation versus other modalities, for instance, Studies looking at RFA versus uh, alcohol injection uh, have shown the benefit of uh, RFA. And a uh, number of uh, good uh, uh, meta-analysis have looked at uh, how RFA uh, uh, performs versus resection. And uh, looks like uh, patients within Milan criteria, uh, although there was no difference in overall survival rates between ablation and resection groups, uh, patients uh, treated with resection had significantly lower recurrence rates. I guess this is reasonable because we know HCC is multifocal, and if you liver, remove more liver parenchyma, you're going to have less recurrences. So this is not really uh, unreasonable. <laughs> uh, whereas uh, for those patients outside the Milan criteria, uh, free studies identified that resection had better outcomes. So, limited to patients with uh, child day cirrhosis and single HCC greater than three centimeters. Now I want to switch gears and look at other tumor types. These two patients are uh, ignored most of the time, but uh, for an ablation program, especially knowing that we don't have a lot of data to substitute to ablation instead of resection at this time, these patients with more systemic disease are really good uh, uh, indications for ablation because most of the time there are not really other treatment options available. And at our center, uh, this applies to a lot of patients with sarcoma, breast cancer, uh, melanomas, as well as other uh, weird uh, uh, tumor types. Uh, important things that in our experience treating these uh, atypical tumors, we, we were able to achieve uh, uh, long-term survival in about 20% uh, of the patients. And uh, when we, for instance, uh, compare the outcomes of uh, ablation plus systemic therapy to ablation alone for uh, match uh, uh, patients with breast cancer, there was definitely uh, an advantage uh, regarding overall survival in the combined uh, treatment arm. And interestingly, you know, at Cleveland Clinic, we have a center for uveal melanoma. We found the same trend uh, for the uh, uveal melanoma patients as well. So in appropriate patients, uh, if they are candidates for ablation, it makes uh, sense to consider ablation on top of systemic therapy in these patients. But these patients require uh, a different algorithm. Every tumor type should be evaluated in individually. And then their tumor biology must be taken into account by ruling systemic progression for at least six months. And a good communication with the oncology should be kept. Most of the time I ask my oncologist, okay, I'll treat it, but do you expect this or you know, any kind of oncologic benefit? And if they believe so, then I'm, you know, I'll be happy to oblige those patients. But otherwise, if we are not really expecting a survival benefit, I don't think uh, there's any point in uh, doing ablation in some aggressive uh, cancers, including pancreatic other than a cancer metastasis to the liver. Uh, sometimes there are some special scenarios. Uh, the patient is re response to systemic therapy. Maybe on the PET scan, one out of eight lesions uh, remains positive. And sometimes the oncologist will also want you to uh, ablate uh, these lesions uh, based on the PET positivity. I think we need more data, but sometimes this is a clinical indication for ablation as well. I think this patient is important to select their biology, and so I don't really uh, offer this treatment to patients with extrapatic disease. Overall, I think that, uh, that we need to change the concepts in liver tumor ablation. Ablation is not a substitute, but an adjunct to liver resection. Just to give some examples, uh, this patient had uh, a large neuroendocrine metastasis on the right lobe of the liver, and then uh, no other lesions on preoperative imaging. But intraoperatively, uh, I identified six additional lesions that are not seen on preoperative imaging. So I did a right hepatectomy and also ablated six lesions. So I was able to uh, treat the, the lesions in this patient. 
Downstaging and parenchymal preservation is a concept that I think needs to be investigated. For instance, this patient has colorectal cancer, has the primary resected at chemotherapy, and had two lesions. You can see one in segment seven, the other one in segment three. And uh, our usual approach to this patient would have been a two-stage hepatectomy, but the patient was well informed, said, you know, I want you to ablate, I'm okay, I want to give it a chance. And uh, ablating these uh, lesions, then we start to follow the patient closely. Interestingly, the lesion in segment seven did not recur, but the one in the left lateral segment recurred. And I did a laparoscopic left lateral segmentectomy and follow up, the right liver lesion um, turned into scar tissue and did not have recurrence. So this, this case illustrates that, you know, with ablation, you can downstage the patient and uh, manage the patient in a minimally invasive fashion as well, saving the patient and the economy uh, significant amount of money as well. Regarding long-term palliation, this was a good index case. Young patient, colorectal synchronous metastasis. She had 14 lesions. She was very young. And at the time of her rectal cancer surgery, it's okay, we'll ablate these lesions, see what happens. Maybe we can downstage her. <clears throat> and so she was ablated in 2010. Three years later, everything was in reg regression except for uh, lesion in segment 4A. And then uh, with a the PET scan, there were no additional lesions and, and did a right trisegmentectomy. And then she did fine, and two years later, she did a recurrence in the remnant. I went in laparoscopically and ablated it. And uh, she got five years out of it. And uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, pretty impressive because uh, I don't think anyone would have given her a chance for long-term survival initially. Disappearing liver mass, I think, is important. Uh, ablation can facilitate the resection and increase the re uh, functional margin uh, with these uh, patients. Another group of patients are patients that were too sick to have anything major done. For instance, this 87-year-old lady has two liver lesions uh, from colorectal metastasis. She's brought her to the exam room on a wheelchair in the uh, always there's no way you can reject these lesions. And this is the patient that I performed ablation. And uh, three years out, uh, there was no recurrence involving these lesions. And actually, in, interestingly, she didn't have any recurrence uh, elsewhere either. We can expand the surgical margin with ablation. This is a patient that I did uh, two-stage hepatectomy, extensive resection, in spite that you always leave some microscopic tumor behind. And uh, these uh, suspicious areas, you can apply the ablation needle to the radio frequency or microwave, and you can expand your uh, surgical margin. So overall, I believe that uh, tumor ablation modality has given a lot of patients with unresectable liver tumors hope in finding their cancer. And new technologies such as advanced uh, microwave ablation, thermosphere ablation, will open new frontiers in the minimal invasive tumor liver cancer. However, uh, evidence-based data regarding its value are necessary to increase the utility of ablation in the management of liver malignancy. Uh, thank you. So I will stop my presentation at this time. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Berber. You really uh, summed it up in a very nice uh, clinical presentation, this is really where the rubber hits the road, and you gave us some very interesting and impressive examples out of your uh, practice. I think uh, watching this um, really kind of sort of um, reminds me why I went into uh, liver surgery in the first place. Um, for me, radiofrequency ablation was actually the entry port uh, to become a liver surgeon because it takes it takes a lot of uh, courage to to do um, to get into this field, but with these techniques that are so much safer now than some of the uh, open resections we did in the old times, um, and so much more effective in some ways, it is a real pleasure uh, for you to have us um, uh, open the window to this practice. Last but not least, we will hear from a radiologist about the interventional aspect or techniques for ablation. 
Dr. Balhendra Kapoor comes out of the Cleveland Clinic as well, is Associate Professor of Radiology, but um, hold on for a moment. He did two residencies. He did a residency in surgery, in general surgery, and radiology. So he's more than qualified to talk to a group of surgeons about the percutaneous ablation techniques and interventional radiology. Dr. Kapoor, thank you very much for um, being part of this. Thank you all, and uh, thank you, Pascal and uh, Aaron, for inviting me. This is really an exciting session to be among all these very experienced surgeons. Uh, and I learned a lot from uh, uh, from all these presentations. Um, you guys definitely made my job a little bit easier because a lot of things I was going to talk about are already discussed. Anyway, but what I will do is that uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the overview of the ablation technology, some of the things we do, some of the recent advances that have taken place in percutaneous ablation. And, um, and here it is. So, uh, I have no disclosures, and uh, th these are the different techniques. Historically, initially, ethanol was used for ablation, then radio frequency came along, microwave and the irreversible electroporation and cryoablation. Uh, we heard quite a bit about radio frequency ablation and microwave ablation. Ethanol ablation is still being used in uh, many parts of the world because HCC is a very common disease. So I'm going to talk a little bit about percutaneous ethanol injection also. So what, it, what we do is that uh, image-guided placement of the needle into the tumor followed by injection of absolute ethanol. And since the soft tumor is surrounded by the firm liver tissue, that facilitates the distribution of ethanol within the tumor. So at, just like most of the ablation cases, it is also uh, good for the smaller tumor. It's low cost. And it can achieve high rates of complete necrosis in small tumors, particularly less than 3 centimeters. So what it does is it causes dehydration, coagulation necrosis, small vessel thrombosis, followed by fibrosis. So those are the um, mechanisms of actions. And here you can see there's a small 22-gauge needle. Now, uh, radio frequency ablation, we already talked about the mechanism of action. It uses high frequency alternating current to destroy the tumor tissue, and the RF energy that's emitted from the exposed tip of electrode is converted into heat, and heat is then ideally disconnected homogeneously in all directions. So this is just a picture I brought. So that's the Medtronic uh, ablation system that we use. And these are the different kind of probes that are available in the market. Now, uh, there are different kinds of probes. They could be needle type versus expandable type. Expandable is the kind of umbrella type. I'll show you that. The needle type uh, is good for visualization of the tip under ultrasound. And expandable tip electrodes are preferred for CT-guided RFA. Obviously, they give the larger volume also. And it uh, provides the better placement of the tines within the tumor since you can see it better. So here is your needle type probe under ultrasound. And this is the example of uh, your expandable type of probe uh, within the liver after chemoembolization for treatment of the residual tumor. Now, uh, in the, the very first slide that uh, Dr. Pascal showed was, uh, that he, uh, or uh, I think it was Dr. Choi who showed that there was carbonization that takes place at the needle and that impedes the conductance. So human tissue has low electric conductance, so most of the RF energy that is uh, delivered, it gets deposited within a few millimeters of the active portion of the probe. And that leads to tissue charring. To avoid tissue charring, the needle type electrodes use internal cooling with pulsating algorithms, and umbrella type electrodes use tem temperature or impedance based energy delivery. In the wet electrodes, they allow the saline infusion into the target tissue that leads to increased electrical as well as thermal conductance. But the major disadvantage of wet electrodes is. The ablation zone tend to be irregular due to inhomogeneous perfusion of the saline into the tissues. Microwave ablation, I'm just going over the different mechanisms of action of these devices. Uh, microwave ablation causes thermal destruction by agitation of water molecules leading to coagulation necrosis. 
It leads to higher intrafemoral temperature, larger volumes, faster ablation, and less susceptibility to hink, a heat sink effect. And since it does not rely on heat circuit, uh, multiple applicators can be used simultaneously, and it produces more predictable ablation zone. And here is the example of, uh, it, this is the Medtronic system that we use for microwave ablation. Now, uh, cryoablation is another technique, uh, not as commonly used as RFA or microwave, but it uses extremely low temperature to kill tumors, um, up to minus 60, minus 40. Uh, tumor is destroyed by both direct and indirect effects. Direct effect is a result of intra and extracellular ice crystal formation shell dehydration and rupture. The in indirect effect resulted uh, from the vascular injury also uh, contributes to ischemia leading to further cell death. And the advantage is uh, it provides precise monitoring of the ablated area during the procedure since you can see the ice wall formation. And this is what it looks like. This is the endocare system. There are multiple systems for all these that are available and this is the Galil medical system with the probes. Now, irreversible electroporation, that's the another modality. It's a non-thermal technique. It causes tissue destruction through millisecond pulses of direct current between monopolar probes, leading uh, with the short duration and high voltage pulses. So that leads to this burst of current can cause perforation of the cell membrane. And uh, the advantage of the irreversible electroporation uh, for the purpose of ablation is that it maintains the structural integrity of the vascular structures and bile ducts. So if the tumors are used, uh, are located closer to the major vascular structure or bile ducts, uh, in that kind of case scenario, irreversible electroporation will be particularly useful. So since it's a non-thermal technique, it leads to complete ablation up to the wall of the blood vessels. And uh, you need adequate margin, as the previous speakers have said, uh, up to one centimeter. And ablation uh, probes are precisely placed and optimally spaced. And this is performed under general anesthesia and cardiac gating to synchronize the pulse delivery. All of the other ones can be used with uh, moderate sedation. And this is the um, equipment. Now, what are the limitations of the image-guided ablations? CT does not provide real-time guidance, and it's suboptimal in low-contrast liver tumors. Ultrasound has limited visibility, particularly in the areas of the liver dome or at the tip of the left lateral segment, or sometimes there's a rib shadow. So under ultrasound, monitoring can be further suboptimal due to gas formation in the ablation area. So to overcome these problems, some of the decent advances uh, have taken place in the last particularly 10 years. The key elements are that the ablation requires accurate needle placement into the target while avoiding important organs and structures, the availability of C-arm cone beam CT, and I'm going to talk about this, in angio suites makes this practical, safer, and time-saving procedure, even in the cases which typically you will not be able to do under regular ultrasound or CT guidance. So what CR CT is, this is the cone beam CT. This is a CT scanner that is built within the angio suite in the flat panel detector. So when you do an angiogram, this automatically software converts into a CT scanner, and all those images that are reconstructed CT images in your axial, coronal, and sagittal projection, they are displayed right in front of your eyes. So you've got the advantage of having two modalities right in front of your eyes. So this was a patient which was a 60-year-old man with that CC contrast-enhanced CT scan showed well-defined lesion in volume segment 4B right here. And uh, after taste, you can see there is a lipidol deposition, but however, there is an area where there is no lipidol deposition. So in that kind uh, of case, the tumor was not completely treated by chemoembolization, so we decided to do ablation on this area. This is pretty high, uh, close to the diaphragm, or getting close to the heart even. So when you are deploying these uh, probes, you want to be careful and uh, know that it's done safely. So having these cone beam CT images 
uh, or the cone beam technology allowed us to put all these probes elect exactly in the center of this area that did not have lip pyridol, so that was not treated, and that we were safely able to do the ablation in this patient. See how close this is to the diaphragm. Now, uh, another technique that has evolved per, uh, very recently in ablation area is the electromagnetic tracking. What it involves is multimodality image fusion and real-time needle tracking. So these equipment involves field generator tracking workstation and specialized track needles. And traditional patches are placed on the skin and a preliminary set of cone beam CT. Or you can use previously done uh, multi-detector CT scan or MRI images. And with that set of images, and here is the example. Uh, this was a patient with cirrhosis, underwent taste twice, presented with new 1.8 centimeter suspicious enhancing lesion in the segment 4A that you see in the image here. And lesion was not visible with ultrasound but patient did have previous uh, MRI. So what we were able to do that the previous MRI was fused with the ultrasound. So on your workstation, while you're doing ultrasound, the MRI images are also following simultaneously and synchronously on the same screen. So you can clearly see where your, the tip of your, your needle is going under ultrasound as well as on MRI that was or CT scan that was previously obtained. So you are seeing the lesion on another modality and the uh, needle is being guided using ultrasound and we were able to get to the lesion and this was the follow-up MRI image after six months and there was no uh, residual disease. And here is another case. It's a 54-year-old male, status post chemoembolization of segment 6 lesion, presented with 2.6 centimeter residual lesion right here. So um, what we, this lesion was well seen on MRI here. You can kind of see an ultrasound, but you, you do see some rib shadow along with it because it's quite peripheral. So I decided to go ahead and uh, decided to, well, I'm going to go ahead and ablate this residual lesion. So I was advancing the needle, but as you start uh, ablating this area, first, you are not seeing it adequately. Second, when you start ablating all the gas that forms, it will further obliterate your region, and you cannot see this lesion adequately. So we were able to uh, transfer this to exact, uh, what we did was we carved out the volumes of the tumor from the previous MRI and overlaid it over the fluoroscopy that we use. And all these electrodes uh, or the probes, I was able to advance to the tumor uh, under fluoroscopy. And here are the other, these are the different two views, what we call as bull eye. That was the previous one and the progression views. And here you can see that I was able to get to the target tumor. And th these are the different sets of images. Here you can kind of see that intraprocedurally we did a non-contrast uh, cone beam CT, and you can see the probes right in the area of the tumor. And these were, this is the 11-month follow-up, the complete necrosis and the ablation of the residual disease. No residual disease is left. So these are some of the new tools that we have now in um, end use suites. Now, in certain cases, uh, a tumor is located pretty high up in the diaphragm. So what are the other things you can do? This is uh, the article that was published in abdominal imaging. And this is showing the use of uh, artificial ascites that you can create between the diaphragm and the liver. And the technique is, uh, these are some of the images I borrowed from Dr. Ariano from Boston. Uh, so you take 290 gauge Chiba needle and take normal saline or D5W and um, under ultrasound or CT guidance you place right in the space just uh, in the peritoneal cavity and you create artificial ascites. The key is that the fluid should not accumulate at the tip of the uh, needle and which is what is happening here. You can see the fluid in this area, but you don't see it, so it is appropriately placed. 
And this was the lesion right up at the uh, top of the uh, liver in the segment eight. And here you see the artificial ascites. And then Dr. Ariana was able to get to the lesion through the ascites and was able to successfully ablate this area. The other thing, uh, sometimes you'll have a different organ, such as colon, that is coming very much in contact with the liver and uh, how to make sure that there is no colonic injury. So for us, in order to do that, there are some techniques. We can use the hydro dissection, that is we inject saline and that saline will displace the colon from the edge of the liver. In one, this particular case, after injecting the saline, even if the hydro dissection, you are not able to separate. So, and again, this is Dr. Ariano, who his images. And uh, he was able to then advance a small ovenate wire and separate by inflation of the balloon. And the colon and the liver edge were separated by the uh, inflation of the balloon. And he was able to do the ablation here. And you can clearly see that the colon is separated. And there is no injury on follow-up to the colon. And these are some other images. Again, showing this is the after. Uh, this was one month po uh, post-ablation scan, showing no residual disease. And you can see that the transverse colon was uh, clearly separated. There was no injury to the transverse colon. Now, a little bit of literature about these different techniques that we use for the percutaneous ethanol injection. Uh, there was an article published in 2005 in Journal of Pathology. For less than two centimeters, the three-year survival was 87.3 percent, five-year survival was 78.3 percent, and for lesion which were less than three centimeters, three-year survival was 81.6 percent, five-year survival was 60.3 percent. Although uh, it's not very predictable ablation by ethanol, but for where the cost is to be kept low, this may be this is still a very useful technique. Now, ethanol versus RFA. Ethanol was the first one to uh, come in the ablation world. Uh, there are six randomized controlled trials, and RFA was found to be superior than ethanol in four trials from viewpoints of overall survival, treatment response, and local tumor creativity. Other two trials showed no significant difference in overall survival. There are multiple studies comparing RFA versus uh, microwave ablation, but no significant difference is seen in these two techniques. Now, this was uh, published in 2016 in uh, Journal Medicine. And uh, again, they compared. Uh, it's a pretty recent article, percutaneous ethanol injection uh, with the radiofrequency ablation. And they thought that the, it's, uh, they are very much comparable than one, uh, for the lesions that are smaller than 1.5 centimeters. They are equally effective in terms of overall survival and time to progression. And uh, cumulative FCC recurrence is significantly higher in patients with tumor more than 1.5 but less than 3 centimeters who undergo percutaneous ethanol injection. So once the tumor size goes more than 1.5, then the recurrence rate is higher in patients with, who are treated with percutaneous ethanol. So the conclusion was RFA should be considered the standard treatment, whereas percutaneous ethanol should be reserved as effective alternative option to patients with the longest diameter of tumor, less than 1.5 centimeters. Now, um, this is again, these are the charts that are showing the overall survival and time to progression. And what I just described, again, is shown in the charts. Now, this was an uh, interesting article that came in European radiology actually last year that combined percutaneous radiofrequency ablation and ethanol injection versus hepatic resection for 2.5 to 5 centimeter solitary FCC lesion uh, retrospective study. Um, they included 141 um, patients in RFA and percutaneous ethanol injection combined. And this was 130 patients with uh, hepatectomy. And the, here you can see this is your RFA and percutaneous ethanol injection combined. 
and this is hepatic resection. So again, you can see that the uh, treatment was more effective with RFA and PEI on this chart. And this is another graph. Uh, and they compared these in two groups of the patients. Again, the, yeah, and this is the complication chart where they showed that um, the, the complication rate was less, according to them, in this group that was treated with RFA and percutaneous ethanol as compared to the hepatic resection. So the conclusion was that RFA and percutaneous ethanol combined had a survival benefit over hepatic resection in treatment of solitary HCCs, particularly for those with 2.1 to 3 centimeter in diameter. Other things that they concluded that RFA and percutaneous ethanol injection combined provided superior survival to hepatic resection in solitary HCC from 2.1 to 5 centimeter in diameter. And it is superior to hepatic resection in complication, length of hospital stay, and cost. And it may be an alternative for solitary HCC within 5 centimeters in diameter. But this is the first study of its kind, so we probably need to, it needs to be validated. Now, oh, what is the technique of combined RFA and percutaneous ethanol injection? Here you can see this is a case with a tumor aged descent to the right hepatic vein, IVC, and right atrium. So alcohol was utilized to treat the medial margin of the tumor, which may have been adequately treated, inadequately treated due to the heat sink effect from the IVC and right hepatic vein. And then RFA was used to treat the lateral part of the tumor. This combination method can be applied when tumor is adjacent into the pericardium or bile duct. Uh, here you can see the RFA probe. This was the alcohol, absolute alcohol needle. So this method can be used when tumor is close to the vital structure, pericardium, bile duct, when non-target thermal injuries can cause serious injuries, serious damage. I could find this study about the cryoblation. A meta-analysis was done that it's quite conflicting. There are two studies, meta-analysis that published in hepatogastroenterology in 2013. It concluded that RFA is superior to cryoblation from the viewpoint of complications and local recurrence. On the other hand, there was a randomized control trial that published in hepatology 2015, and they concluded that the local tumor progression is significantly less frequent in cryoblation than in RFA. Uh, just a few words about irreversible electroporation. There was a study that was published in cardiovascular and interventional radiology, that's the European Journal. 101 patients underwent IRE ablation for primary and metastatic lesions, post IRE CT scan or MRI evaluated. And what the conclusion essentially they're trying to say is that um, abnormal vascular, and these were the distance between the tumor and the vessels, the mean distance was 2.3 plus minus 2.35 millimeters, so they were very close. And the abnormal vascular changes were noted only in seven of 158 vessels, which is 4.4 percent, so pretty low. Uh, and I'll talk about this one more study where the cone beam CT, which I was talking about, that's part of the angiography switch nowadays. And the, uh, this was a study published in oncology in 2017. Uh, two groups, the one with the ablation was done with the cone beam CT versus non-cone beam CT. And then there were two groups, TACE plus RFA versus RFA alone. And um, the, their conclusion was that the complete ablation rate in cone beam CT versus non-cone beam CT groups were 89.4% and 63.0% respectively. So quite significant difference. And on the regression analysis, the non-CBCT group, RFA alone, alone without taste and male gender were significant independent variables. So I have a couple more, but I think I'm going to stop here, uh, not to go too far. Um, Pascal, I think this is, if that's okay. Dr. Kafour, thank you very much for this tour de force of uh, a different perspective, obviously, and um, 
clearly um, you come from a, a different world for the same problem. And uh, one has to recognize that surgeons and interventional radiologists need to understand each other and work together on this problem, obviously, and can be um, uh, combined, can combine their forces. So we are done with the didactic portion of this program. And we have, if I'm correct, approximately 10, 15 minutes left for questions. Um, I would like to um, open these questions to the entire panel. Uh, so far, I can see one uh, question on the um, chat page. And this is from Dr. Nalugo. Dr. Kapoor, why, by what mechanism, and I guess this question can be also answered by uh, Dr. Anidi, by what sure. mechanism does electroporation kill tumor cells? Dr. Kapoor, you want to take a stab at that? Uh, sure. Uh, basically, what electroporation does is that these are the high voltage short bursts of current that will cause uh, pores within the cell membranes, essentially by causing the dis uh, dis destroying, causing these pores in the cell membrane to destroy the cells. In the nutshell, that would be, and that leads to the death and destruction of these uh, tumor cells. And Dr. Dr. Anidhi, do you, you have, have anything to, do you have anything sure. to add to that? Of course I do. The, um, so if you look at uh, electroporation, you have two electrodes. And so just imagine you're just making a capacitor. So a capacitor is you have a, a certain charge. So if you think back in the days when we used to do reversible electroporation to put big molecules into a cell like DNA or something like that, so you would put a charge of about, four, about 300 volts across a centimeter, OK? So when you put tissue in there, it'll stretch, it'll stretch a cell membrane at 300 volts per centimeter, and you'll create a pore. And then when you're porated, you can put something in, you let the capacitor go, and your, you know, your voltage go, and boom, your cell's closed. Now when we do IRE, um, we're putting 3,000 volts across a centimeter. So at that level of a capacitor, you actually are delivering current. So you're stretching the cells. You're well above the membrane potential, and therefore you're disrupting the membrane and you're creating irreversible pores, and that triggers the cells to cell death. We're building the next generation IRE, it's called H-Fire, and so rather than using direct current, we're using alternating current, and um, the waveform is called a, um, a 252 waveform, so it just gives you peaks for a pulse over the membrane potential, which triggers uh, cells to cell death. So that's how you Very know. nice. Get above the cell. You have to get above the resting membrane potential. Very interesting. We're, we're looking forward to, to uh, hearing more about this. In the absence of any other questions, I would like to just make a few comments and then open up a couple of questions to each of the panel members. Now, we have, to summarize, we have learned that um, the two main, I would say, it's safe to say right now that the two main ablation methods that are currently in use are RFA and microwave. So I'm just going to comment and um, recapitulate. RFA is alternating current. Agitation of ions creates a heat. There is a central necrosis that occurred. There is a central heat vo heated volume directly through this mechanism of ion agitation. But there is also conduction that occurs outside of that area, uh, just like with uh, microwave ablation, I would say. Microwave ablation, on the other hand, is a technology that does not respect any structures in the near field. In other words, when you are in that wave field, everything gets killed. And so my question to Dr. Ioannidi there is, what about the larger veins? What about bile ducts? What about things that are in the way? How do you manage that with microwave ablation? Because in RFA, we, we have the luxury to go close to a large vein because we know that the heat sink takes care uh, of not injuring that, in general, not injuring that tissue. You actually see ablation zones where the vessel transverses that ablation zone is intact. Can you comment on that for, for, for us? Sure. 
So when it comes to microwave, as you mentioned, everything in the microwave near field is going to be destroyed. Even if you have an air, if you have your hand with a rubber glove, you know, latex glove on in the microwave near field, your hand will get cooked. If there's an air gap, unlike radio frequency ablation, if you have an air, you have tissue air gap in other tissue, and that far tissue is still within the microwave near field, it's going to get cooked. It's just the nature of microwave. So it's from a safety point of view, you have to know what your extent of your microwave near field is from your the edge of your antenna, and that's good and bad. So um, for two, four, five gigahertz, you know that's going to be a, uh, about one and a half to two centimeters. So if you're trying to preserve something like a bile duct or a vessel, as you mentioned, or the heart or something close, you need to park your antenna off that tissue. You can't do what they do with water hydro dissection, which is an insulator, because it doesn't work. You need physical separation from the fear field to get out of the microwave near field. Then you can right. play with conduct conductive heating um, and then there's a couple other tricks in terms of shielding. So you can shield something, like you can put a malleable next to the pericardium over the liver, and it'll reflect the wave. So the wave won't go through, it'll reflect. So you can shield is another option. All right. Thank you very much. So I, I think these are so fundamental understandings. Now I'm going to ask some que questions to each of the panel members, and I'll start with Dr. Ianidi. What system do you use routinely in your practice? Is there one system that you prefer over others? So we don't Dr. Use monopolar radio. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we don't use monopolar radio frequency ablation anymore. We stopped using that back in, I don't know, 2006. Um, so fortunately, I'm in a uh, situation where we have all three current microwave systems. So we use all three. And I would I say see. there's so it's microwave. Systems, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Basically. We use microwave. So we have all three. We have uh, Emprint, okay. Certus, and Solero. And we use all three of those. Plus we use IRE clinically. Dr. Choi, what is what is the what is your preferred system? Uh, you know, even though my talk was on mic uh, RFA, I actually use microwave almost exclusively. <laughs> yeah, no, don't 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 be ashamed of that. That's actually that's actually probably where everything is going. Dr. Berber. Yeah, I I use uh, the thermosphere now, and uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is, um, as I showed in the slides, uh, the, the local recurrence rate is lower with microwave uh, compared to RFA, and in our clinical experience, we've seen that we're able to cut down our local treatment failure by half, and it's, it's faster uh, than radio frequency ablation, so I, the, the anesthesia time is shorter for the patients. And uh, um, in the, with the recent advances, uh, you know, in maybe in response to your first question as well, the um, ablation zone is more predictable with these new technologies. So we don't really see in clinical experience so much uh, spread of the energy. So because it's more recent, the technology is faster and, and more effective. I, I use the thermosphere now. Dr. Kapoor? Yeah, mostly microwave. That's very nice. Next question, again, to all members. How large a lesion would you ablate maximally in the liver today, Dr. Yanidi? Yeah, you don't want to ask me that question. The, um, so you can answer. Your answer can be, I don't care about the size. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, obviously we're talking about biology of disease. And so I agree with Dr. Berber's comment. You know, you start getting above four centimeters or five centimeters. I think you not need, need to add some other therapies. Uh, however, I mean, I'll go ahead and tell you, we've ablated things 15 centimeters. Those are usual, unusual in specific circumstances in which we do things like that. But again, with microwave technology, there are no limits to what you can ablate. So the question is, what should you ablate? Correct. Very good answer. Dr. Dr. Choi. Uh, generally, I, I am more confident about ablating tumors that are five centimeters or less, but um, but I have ablated tumors larger than that in the past, as, as large as about eight centimeters using multiple probes. And have you been happy with the results? Uh, 
that patient actually died of a different <laughs> cause, cardiovascular, uh, but okay. the patient did not have a recurrence when the patient died. All right. Dr. Berber, do you, you have know, any size I, limit? Well, um, I would say that based on the clinical indications, you might treat large lesions as well. But realistically, I would say that I, I, I consider four CIDB as a realistic uh, size limit for myself now. Unless, like, the patient doesn't have any option and you need, and debulking is, is, a, is kind of the way to go in that patient. Dr. Kapoor? Exactly, same thing. Uh, I'm, Usually about four centimeters. If I'm planning a combined treatment like chemoembolization with ablation, then I can go up to five, six. Then I know that it's a, just a different algorithm, but otherwise, less than, I try to stay below four. So my last question to the entire panel, how do you follow, how do you follow an ablated patient, Dr. Yanidi? Sure. So we're pretty specific. You know, we, so within a month of the procedure, uh, we'll do cross-sectional imaging. And that first round of imaging is usually to make sure that um, we have done a complete ablation. And then based on the pathology, which is usually metastatic colon or H I mostly do HCC or cholangio, usually we'll image about um, uh, every four months for the first two years and then space it out depending on the person and tumor markers and blah, 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 blah about every six months for the next um, years two through five. And then if it's HCC, you go back to normal screening after five years. And Very good. Person. Yeah. Dr. Choi, I get do you a, have an algorithm? Yeah, I, I, uh, it depends on the patient and their disease and the, their disease burden that was treated. But in general, I get a repeat imaging in one month just to make sure that there's no immediate recurrence. And then uh, depending on the situation, I get repeat images between three to six months for the next two years. Anything after that? Or then you go to yearly? Uh, yeah. Uh, so in, 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 the, uh, in our practice, uh, our medical oncologists then basically take over the care. And then after that, right. they uh, get follow-up imaging. And then they you know, Very course, good. You know, get to me. Very good. Dr. Berber. I get a scan within the first two weeks, and then every three months for the first two years, then biannually. Very good. And Dr. Kapoor, do you do any follow-up? Uh, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> the uh, Again, first month, uh, then every three months after that uh, for a year or two. Um, but pretty much Ed and I uh, have the same protocol, except he does his first scan in two weeks. Very interesting. So it seems like that there's almost a consensus here. I guess time is up, and um, I thank all the participants again very much for participating. I hope that the audience enjoyed this uh, webinar, and uh, I look forward to uh, future webinars on uh, other um, issues and themes. Thank you very much to everybody, and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Steve.